Okay, class, time to begin. Um, as always, reminders. Um, I know that many of you have already started working on homework uh, six. It's, uh, it's due uh, 25th. Is that right? Is it due 25th? Um, okay, so it's due 25th. Um, oh, that's the last day of, that's the last lecture, right? Uh, so that's next Tuesday. Uh, this project, this homework can take a while to run. And as some of you came to me in the office hours, there are, you might run into numerical issues and such things. So, uh, especially with the logistic regression, so get, I encourage you to start soon and uh, get going as, as quickly as you can. Um, also, there's a, uh, there's a opportunity for extra credit with uh, an ensemble. And the good thing is if you do all three of them, then you have three different runs for your three different learning algorithms that you've already implemented for your project. Um, the projects are due on the, the last day of the semester, which is the last, I think, exam day, May 3rd. And this requires submissions to both Kaggle and to Canvas. And just remember on Kaggle, you need to pick six of your submissions as the official ones. And these will be the ones that we will actually grade. Uh, and there's a final exam. The final exam covers everything that we've seen from and including learning theory. And it's in class at 10.30 a.m. Um, on May, on the 3rd of May. Uh, it's gonna be for two hours and it will kind of look like your midterm. Any questions about this? Yes. Yes. Um, so you were for the final protection course for the so that I forgot to see my outputs. So um, should I re-see them and resubmit like my final protection? So that what do you mean you forgot to see the output? So I'm mean, assuming it's so that the TAs can run our code. Oh, I see, I see. Okay. So if your results are in the ballpark of the right thing, then it's okay. Yeah, so because pretty much most of what we've done involves convex things, uh, the seed should not change by more than a tiny amount. The seed should not change the result by more than a tiny amount. There's a question on uh, Zoom. Can we get the answers for uh, the theory parts of homework four and also homework five so that we can start studying for the final? And uh, we'll, we'll try to get that to you uh, by maybe this weekend. Yes. So, my question is so, what if we overload from our own code? Like, uh, for example, we change the data set. Do we have to submit two versions of the exact same code but with that one key? Uh, you, it could be like a parameter. Uh, and explain in your README what you did. I think the README is going to be super important here um, because that's really the, uh, the only hope we have of running anything. Uh, and a reminder uh, for your project, you're allowed to use a neural network library for one, at most one of the runs. So if you find that more than one of those has some neural network library, you'll actually get a zero for that question, that uh, that one sixth of the project really. But if you have to do it for more than that, you'll get more zeros. Okay, any other questions? If there aren't any, let's continue where we left off. We were talking about neural networks. In the last lecture, we looked at what a neural network is. And uh, I spent a bit of time describing how the prediction process works with neural networks. And just got started talking about training neural networks. Uh, we didn't touch the back propagation algorithm yet. What we did do was uh, set up this loss minimization um, uh, uh, framework for training neural networks. We had this running example of a neural network. This is a two layer neural network that is that takes two inputs, has one hidden layer with two units and one output, uh, which is uh, a regression. And the activations on both the hidden units are sigmoids and there's no activation on the output. In other words, it's also called a linear activation. So this is a neural network that takes two dimensional inputs and produces real numbers as outputs. And in the standard learning setup, we are given a training set. 
So the training set includes examples about what uh, about these units uh, x1 and x2 are two numbers. So you can think of it as a vector x, which is a pair, and uh, co combined with an output. So you have pair of x and y. Um, and given an input x, which is a pair x1, x2, it's a vector of size two. Uh, you can step through this whole process here, which is the forward pass. The forward pass basically just goes through the neural net, uh, you know, uh, uh, goes through the different layers of the neural network to produce an output. So uh, you get an output y. This output y, you can think of it as given the neural network's current parameters, what output does it predict for the input x? So we have the neural network prediction y, and we also have a true label yi. And now, given these two things, we can define the loss. Uh, the, the definition of the loss uh, at a high level depends on the nature of the problem. If you have a regression problem, a natural loss is a squared loss. If you have a classification problem, for binary classification, we have multiple natural losses. We have the logistic loss, we have the SVM loss, we can use the perceptron loss, pick your favorite. So in this case, we have a regression problem. So the loss function for this particular example might be something like uh, the difference between the square difference between the uh, prediction and the ground truth. Uh, we multiply by a half because we're going to take derivatives of this later. So this quantity here can be thought of as the penalty that's assigned to all of these parameters that define the neural network for mispredicting the label y when in fact the ground truth is yi. So this, this is roughly where we stopped in the last lecture. Questions? Let's continue forward. So I'm going to abstract this whole thing here as just some NN. It's some network. It could be two layers. It could have 2 million layers. We don't care. At this point, it's some function that has two inputs, just two inputs. It takes the input x, and it also has a set of parameters that define its behavior. So I may write something like Nn of uh, x and w. So this is saying what output the, this particular network architecture produce when the current when the who, when its weights are w and the input is x. Our goal with learning is to find the best set of weights. Uh, remember, by the way, we are assuming that uh, the architecture is fixed. We are assuming that we are given an architecture for this network, and we don't have to think about how the how to design the architecture. So, the classifier or the model and then it's completely defined by its weights because the architecture is fixed. And our goal of learning is to learn these weights by minimizing the total loss. So I can uh, say something like the prediction of the neural network, for example, i is nn applied to xi and w, and the ground truth is yi. And these two together give me enough information to compute the value of the loss l. For that particular example, I sum up the loss over all these examples that I have in the training set, and I get a function. Because I have summed over the training set, the only thing that is left unspecified inside this box is, is the weights itself. Because everything else, uh, the iterating over i gives us xy. The neural network architecture tells us what the architecture is. The only thing that is left unspecified is the weights. It's uh, and so we are going to minimize over all possible weights to find the best one. OK, so what I have done here is I've taken um, this abstract class of functions that I'm calling a neural network. It's basically pretty much any function and any differentiable function. And then I have set up this loss minimization problem. If it's a classification task, this loss could be something like um, logistic regression. If it's a multi-class classification task, the natural loss is something that we've not covered in this class, but the natural loss for multi-class classification uh, could be something called cross-entropy. 
or it could be a multi-class SVM. Cross entropy is more commonly used these days because there are robust implementations of that, but that's just a technical detail. And if it's a binary classification problem, the natural loss could be something like logistic loss or the hinge loss or perceptron loss. And just as a um, sort of a uh, fun trivia thing, cross entropy is just a multi-class extension of logistic regression. So it's you know just it's essentially a, a similar idea. Okay, one way or another, we have set up an optimization problem. Now the question is, how do we solve the optimization problem? What algorithm do we use to optimize the set? Any ideas? Yeah. Good choice. So we can use stochastic gradient descent. Why? Because that's the only thing we've seen. Um, and also because it turns out that uh, most other algorithms that are in use popularly today build on top of this, and we'll talk about that later on. Uh, the standard uh, sort of formula for stochastic gradient descent looks like this. You're given a training set, x, y. We're assuming that x's are somehow in some d-dimensional vector space. And because our model is a neural network, we're not assuming that these features are particularly well-crafted or anything. They're just sensor readings or just words or pixels in an image or something like that. And then we have already defined the, the architecture of the neural network, and I'm calling that NN. The only thing left to learn is the set of all the weights that are inside that neural network. And by all the weights, I mean at all the layers. I'm putting that whole thing into this bucket called W. W consists of many, many vectors and tens and matrices and so on. Just a big list of numbers, if you will. Our goal is to learn the, those numbers. And SGD proceeds in the following way. First, we initialize the parameters, and we'll talk about that later. And we learning proceeds through multiple epochs. We start with the, uh, the standard thing about shuffling the data set at the beginning of each epoch. And then we iterate over the data, over the shuffled data. Um, we pick one example, xi, yi. We pretend that this example is the entirety of the data set, training set we have. We have no other data except this one example. If you had only one example, this summation goes away. Okay, if our data set consists of only one example, we just need to minimize the loss. We don't have a, because the summation is over just one thing. So we can compute the gradient of the loss for that one example, um, and then update the weights. And with this step is really updating all the weights using all the gradients. Um, and there is a learning rate, gamma t, that, uh, that, that that defines how big of the step we should use. And the weight update essentially uses the same uh, idea. You have a gradient. The gradient defines the direction in which this function, in this case, the function is the function nn applied to x and w as a function of uh, as a function of w. So the gradient tells you how quickly this function changes. Um, uh, around, um, uh, given that we are currently the, uh, at this point, W. And in particular, it tells you which direction does the function change, grow the fastest. And the, that's the gradient. This is a stochastic gradient, which means it's a stochastic estimate of the true gradient. And we take a step in the opposite direction of that uh, estimate. That's why we have a minus here. We do this. For the entire data set, that takes us to the end of the epoch. We do this for a whole bunch of epochs. And uh, at some point, we declare that we are done. And we return all the weights together. By giving all the weights, we've essentially defined the neural network. We have, you know, in some sense, brought that neural network to life. I hate that metaphor, but, you know, there. Um, any questions? Yeah. Excellent question. We'll come to that hopefully in maybe about 40 minutes from now. Um, yeah, this is a very good question, and it turns out there's a very robust uh, cottage industry of research around that exact question. How do you pick learning rates? That many tweaks are possible with learning rates. And then there is also the question of uh, 
how do you initialize the parameters with SVM, with logistic regression, and also with perceptron, it turns out it didn't really matter how you initialize the parameters because all these objectives that you're optimizing for those models had were convex functions. They looked like this. I mean, that's just a cartoon estimate, but no matter where you start, if you like imagine um, uh, if your mental model is like a ball that's rolling down the hill, no matter where you start this process, it'll end up at the bottom. But uh, with neural networks, the, the objective landscape, sometimes that's the word, that's, that's the phrase that we use, the objective landscape has many hills and valleys. Depending on where you start, you might end up in a different valley. And your initialization might matter a lot. So with neural networks in particular, initializations tend to matter a lot because the objective is not convex. And once again, the, answer, the question is, uh, how do you then do any experiments? Answer, you try out many different initializations. Uh, and this is just a random thing. I mean, you don't have any scientific answer there. Have we solved everything? We have a continuous function. We know how to compute the gradient. You know how to implement this algorithm. By the way, this is also, you can think of it as like a template for the algorithm that you might implement for your uh, uh, homework for logistic regression. Have we done everything? What else is left to do? Yeah. Excellent question. We never know that. And in fact, like I said, in practice, we just uh, um, try a few different initializations and take the best one that we can find based on, say, the uh, a held out data set. That's one option. Another option is uh, to report, suppose the thing that you're selling is the model. That's what you do. Suppose the thing you're selling is uh, a, a, a way to approach a problem. Then you try different initializations and you report the average accuracy or something across different initializations because you say that uh, my, if you use my approach for learning or for learning rate selection or for neural network architecture or whatever, then it is surprisingly robust to initialization, the initialization because look, the standard deviation is so little. You could do those things. That's one thing. The second thing to note is we will probably never find the true function anyway because True function, remember, remember the first or the second lecture, the true function is really the mind of nature. We are trying to approximate that using a model that we are building. Who said that the uh, thing that decides the stock price for some stock tomorrow is a 17 layer neural network? It's a 17 layer perceptron. Maybe it's not. So you're already, we are entering the game uh, accepting that we will make an approximation. So, you know, in some sense, we've already resigned to a problem. We are already resigned to a problem. Yes, there's a question on Zoom. Is W the set of all the weights of all the nodes in the network? That's right. It's a bucket consisting of every single weight inside the model. Yes. Okay, the question is, can we add a regularizer? Yeah, sure. Feel free to it. You can add a regularizer to it. Yeah. I have a question about how they train the speed to big because they have in models that train for six months. Yeah. Does that mean they train the same model like hundreds of thousands of times they started on? Or how do they put their training to start? Uh they have this is where machine learning becomes a massive engineering effort. You need to write really, really good code. Uh there is almost there's like a growing um a subfield of computer science that's being that's called uh, ML ops, uh, where you're trying to make sure that you know if my model crashes, you can pick it up and let's say it crashes after running for uh, when the epoch is uh, seven thousand. Um, do you restart from one? No, you keep checkpoints all the way so that you pick up from where you almost where you left off. Let's say your learner crashes and then uh, 
um, you know, you, you, because you don't have enough memory. What can you do? Well, you can design new learning teams that can take multiple machines. So ML ops is, and ML systems is like a really uh, rich area of exploration. And uh, by rich, I mean both intellectually and monetarily uh, because uh, there's a lot of money there. But I want to go back to the question. Let's take those uh, stupidly large networks that you just talked about. Can you now train that? I, like, let's say I give you a neural network. What do you do now? What's left? Yeah? No, no. Uh, let's talk about training first. Do you know how to train it? Yeah? Yes. Are you telling me that you can't do it on paper? I mean, it's a ton of layers. That's, that, that's the thing. Think about how do you compute the gradient. With SVM, we worked out the gradient computation by hand, right? That was a one layer neural network. Okay. Uh, with two layers, you can probably just compute it by hand. In fact, when I was in my undergrad and I, had an, uh, I took a class on neural networks, they made me compute the gradients of a two layer network by hand for a homework. That was horrible. Um, two layers is horrible. One layer is okay. Um, in I think 2017, there was a neural network that did image classification that had 150 layers. Uh, Chat GPT has I don't know how many layers, like thousands of them, depending on the word layer loses its meaning at this point. Now, if you have to manually compute the gradient for all of those things. You will lose your mind. So we need help. And the answer is uh, uh, what you know. If, if we have, like, okay, okay, this is the same thing. The, the neural net just because the neural network is a differentiable function does not mean the process of calculating the value of the derivative is easy, because that itself, as the network becomes bigger, that itself becomes hard. There's a question: Can we use numerical methods to compute the gradient? In fact, there are some papers quite a while back that did use numerical methods for computing the gradients. It turns out that we can do better than using numerical methods for computing gradients. And that's, um, you know, you know it, it involves this idea that basically tries to mechanize the process of computing gradients into, uh, into an algorithm. That this is an efficient algorithm for computing derivatives of large uh, continuous uh, differentiable functions, sub differentiable functions. This algorithm has a name. It's called back propagation. Some of you may have heard of back propagation, and you might have heard that back propagation is the engine that drives neural network learning today. The reason is because back propagation is the engine that does gradient calculation, and it's not back propagation that trains neural networks, it's stochastic gradient descent or some extension thereof. So just to kind of make sure that we are all on the same page. If we have a neural network, by that I mean, we have the structure of the network, all the nodes and the edges, we have all the activations, and we have all the weights, then we can make predictions for new n because now we have all the information needed for making the prediction. If we had the true label, for an example, then using that prediction, we can compute the loss of the, the loss on that example, provided we've already defined the loss function. If we can take the derivative of that loss function, then we are in business. We can now plug it into bad stochastic gradient descent and make the neural network better. Okay. Any questions before we talk about back propagation? If you need the ground truth so that 
uh, you have a predicted one and you have the ground, the true label and the loss function just says how far is the predicted one from the true one or how much penalty should the model pay for predicting this one when in fact the ground truth was something else. It's the same thing that uh, we did for say SVMs and um, it's a standard supervised setting. Okay, now I'm going to talk about uh, back propagation, but I want to start really, really, really small. Let's look at some very basic uh, calculus. Let's say I have a function f that has two inputs, x and y. These are numbers. So the, these are just real values. So f of x comma y is x plus y. Now I can ask what's the partial derivative of f with respect to x, and that's one. The partial derivative of f with respect to y is also one. This should not come as a shock to any of you. I hope not. I can do this for products. If f of x, y is the product x times y, then the partial derivative of f with respect to y is x. And similarly, uh, um, I can also do so if this, these are three blocks here. Similarly, I can also do uh, handle functions like max of uh, x comma y. The partial derivative of f with respect to x now, it's a little bit more complicated. This is, we are no longer calculating the derivative. We are calculating the subgradient or the subderivative. If x is greater than y, which means that the winner of max is x, then the partial derivative is 1. Because f of x comma y can be written as x if x is greater than y and y if x is less than y. And the partial derivative basically goes into both those arms. Um, if x is greater than y, then the partial derivative of the gray of f with respect to x is 1. If x is less than y, then what we get is not a function of x, so the partial derivative is 0. So that's why we have this these two things. Similarly, uh, the, I can talk about partial derivative of f with respect to y. Questions about this before we make this a little bit more difficult. It's worth thinking about what partial derivatives and gradients are. Um, in these cases and in all other cases, the partial derivative simply represents the rate of change of the function f with respect to a small change in it. This is the standard definition of the gradient that we have uh, from whenever we were introduced to these things. And this, just this idea can be used to uh, 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 with numerical methods to compute gradients, but that's not the direction we're going. Let's take a slightly more complicated case that's going to present a little bit of more interesting things that almost directly take us to back propagation. Let's say I have a function f. f is a function of three variables, x, y, and z. And it's defined this way. It is x times y squared plus z. Now you can calculate all the partial derivatives by hand, right? It's not particularly hard. You can just do it. However, uh, let's deal with the exact same uh, function in a slightly different way. Instead of calculating Things like the partial derivative of f with respect to, let's say, y is 2xy, which is what you should get. Instead of doing that, I'm going to define the function f as a, as a using other functions that we have. I'm going to break it down into simpler terms. Let's say I define this other function g, which is simply g is a function, g of y and z is y squared plus z. G is a function of two things, only two things. And f is really a product f of x comma y comma z. And I'm defining it to be a product of x times g of y and z. I've done nothing here other than just introduce this extra thing called g, right? If you substitute this in here, you get back the original thing. But this sort of giving these names to intermediate steps allows us to use uh, the chain rule of differentiation. Each 
function here. In this case, we have two functions, right? Each function here is by itself rather simple. Um, rather than thinking of it this way, I'm going to write, call it just x times g. And here, x and g. f is a function of two things. f is a function of x and g, where g itself is a function of y and z. So I can ask, what's the derivative of x of g with respect to y? That's 2y. I can ask what's the derivative of g with respect to z. That's simply 1. I can ask what's the derivative of f with respect to x, and the, that's g. And the derivative of f with respect to g is x. Each of these so the pieces are basically the simple things that we knew before. I'm just putting them together uh, to define a slightly more complicated function. Before we move on, any questions about that? Because I'll start building on top of this now. No questions? So yeah, each sub component here is simple and we know how to calculate uh, its partial derivatives. The key idea of back propagation is we build up compound expressions by building them by, uh, by composing simple pieces. And then for each of those simple pieces, suppose we know how to calculate the derivative of that simple piece with respect to its input. Then we kind of, then we use the one trick and only one trick, which is the chain rule. There are two tricks actually. There's a chain rule and uh, uh, the idea of just not doing work that you've already done before, memoization. Together we get back propagation, but we'll get to that later. Uh, we keep applying the chain rule. Let's see how this works. Suppose I want to know what's the partial derivative of f with respect to y. I can ask, f is a function, let's look at this thing here. f is a function in this case of x and g. So there's no y there. So that means I need to, the partial derivative of f with respect to y is the partial derivative of f with respect to g times the derivative of g with respect to y. I know how to calculate this. This is what I had in the previous slide. I know how to calculate this. Each of those by is simple, so I can just multiply them and I get 2xy. The same thing that we got before, except I have made it a little more complicated. Actually, I've not made it complicated. I've made it more composable so that and so that even a program can do it. I've made it in such a way that even a program can take these pieces and I keep applying the same rule and do this again and again. I'm going to repeat the exact same idea, but using a slightly different notation. This notation is something called a computation graph. I can write this function f as this graph where every node, every internal node represents some function. So I have three inputs for this thing, x, y, and z. Those are in these blue boxes. y and z feed into this node called g, which computes this function here. Every node computes a function. Compute y squared plus z. Now x and g together feed into f, which computes just the product of its input to get you the original function that we have. Do you agree that this graph, you know, with the interpretation I just described, represents the same function? Yeah. So now using this, I can apply what I call the forward path in the previous lecture. The forward path simply computes the value of this function for specific inputs. So if x is 3 and y is 2 and z is 1, first I can compute the value of g, which is just y squared plus z, which gives me 5. And then this f is simply the product of this input, so I get 15. So the forward path is simply applying the inputs in the computation graph and going all the way through the top. So far, so good. Now, it's not enough that my function is uh, uh, can compute the forward path. It can also compute the backward path. What that means is I, I can compute the derivatives of along all the paths that I just described. Let's go through this one, one edge at a time. First, let's consider this edge. Now, f from this side has the uh, f multiplies just x and g. 
along this edge, the gradient is partial derivative of f with respect to x, but we know it's equal to g. So, but I know the value of g because when I computed in the forward path, I computed 15, I had the value of g, so the gradient just goes this way. So the value of the derivative so at this for this input along simply partial derivative of f with respect to x is equal to g, which is 5. I can go down the other way. Here, I'm computing the partial derivative of f with respect to g because that's the input that's feeding in. Well, f by itself is just a function that multiplies x and g, so the partial derivative is simply x. We know the value of x because that's what went in during the forward pass. So x is equal to 5. No, did I say 5? No, it's 3. So what we've just done is we've computed the gradients along just those two edges. I can now recursively apply the same process to these nodes. Before we move on, before I do the recursive thing, any questions? Any questions on Zoom? By itself, back propagation is a very simple uh, algorithm. Implementing it requires a little bit of bookkeeping. You need to remember a few things, and implementing it efficiently means you have to do a fair bit of heavy lifting. But the simplest version of it is rather simple, like about 50 lines of code. Okay, so now let's talk about this edge here. So that edge is more interesting. I can do two things. I can compute the derivative of g with respect to its input, so gradient, partial derivative of g with respect to y. I know the I know how to compute that because g is simply y square plus 2, y square plus d, so this is equal to, to y. So that edge by itself is easy. But if I want the partial derivative of f with respect to y, then I have to multiply all the things along this way. Because that's what the chain rule is. The chain rule, partial derivative of f with respect to y is f with respect to g, which we already got, times the gradient of g with respect to y. So we are multiplying the whole path. So that's what we have here. The partial derivative of f with respect to y is simply the product of these two things. And three, we already computed. We don't need to do it again. We just copy it here. And this is 2y, so we know the gradient along for this particular thing of the original function is 12 for this example. Questions? This was the first non-trivial thing that we did so far. Let's do one more of that, which is this edge here. I know how to compute the gradient of g with respect to z, which is simply 1. Um, and so, because you know, I know I, I'm just taking the derivative of that thing with respect to z. And now, if I want to compute the partial derivative of f with respect to z, I need to multiply everything along this path here, all the gradients that we have accumulated. So we have 3 times 1, so it should be 3. So the partial derivative of f with respect to y is the gradient of f with respect to g times the gradient of g with respect to uh, z. So you're multiplying 3 times 1, which is 3. Now we're done. We have no more edges to traverse. So we've essentially computed all partial derivatives for this function f when its inputs are uh, 3 to 1. So I can write this very compactly as the gradient of f is the vector with respect to x, it was 5. With respect to y, it is 12. With respect to z, it is 3. At this point, some of you must have some questions. <laughs> 
Yes. So when you do uh, the the part of the that's going on back to the inspect the wire, um, we have to multiply by the two to the two by square to bring the four to the square. Say that again. When we did it, it was here. Yeah, so it's the uh, three from the top of the area of So this is here. This is the y. And when y equals two, that's this. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the question is how we make the three and how we make these things smaller. These things, you code them in. I mean, those are easy. That's the thing. We only have like about 50 building blocks. We have addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponential, log, sine, cosine, um, you know, sigmoids, uh, tan h, max. There's like a library of basic functions that you just code in. And then any other function you want to do, you can write in terms of those things. And if you feel like your library is not sufficient, just code it in. Yes. In fact, you have to do it. The, the actual implementations of any of these things are in terms of the matrix version of a chain rule. Simply because if you do this one element at a time, first of all, it's kind of tedious. Uh, second, it does not allow you to take advantage of uh, any sort of matrix libraries that you might have. And there, instead of just multiplying three times uh, uh, this thing, you might end up having to do matrix vector product or matrix matrix product. But, you know, I would encourage you to kind of think about implementing the naive version that doesn't have these matrices because literally with just, I think, Addition, um, multiplication, I mean, keep multiplying by one, addition of two numbers, multiplication of two numbers, taking e power a number and dividing the one number by another. You have mm -hmm. all the pieces you need to implement that toy neural network that we had, the two layer neural network. You can actually implement back propagation for that. Um, and it's going to be super simple, and the network is small enough that. It's, it, it doesn't need the matrix uh, support. Yeah. Uh, X cannot point this way like this. Ah, so then that's good. The, the, in fact, we will actually, that's the general case. Uh, we will have that and what you what you need to do then is to compute the gradient of f with respect to x. You need to add up all the incoming edges, add up the gradients along all the paths. In fact, that's going to be the next step. So, the abstraction that we have is every node in this computation graph knows how to do two things and only two things. It knows how to compute. If, if every node is a function. It knows how to compute the value of that function with respect to its input. Given its input, it knows how to compute its value. So we had a function f that actually was just a function of two things. Let's call it x and uh, two formal parameters. Let's call that uh, a and b. It just produced the product. It just so happened that we instantiated this with f, x, and g. So we have a node that knows how to compute it, the value of the function. The second thing it knows is to compute the partial derivative of its output with respect to its input for every path that's fed into it. And these are going to be defined. These are going to be hard coded independently of the graph, the rest of the graph that we have. And in fact, they are just going to be part of a big library. That's what neural network libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow are. They are, among other things, like this big collection of these modules, each of which knows how to compute the forward pass and the backward pass. Using these little modules, we can construct larger functions. Those larger functions are themselves actually modules. Why? Because they know how to do their entire forward and their entire backward by using this chain rule. 
and you keep building these bigger and bigger models. At this point, we don't care about whether the neural network has 10 layers or 100,000 layers, because we are only worried about these little pieces and letting this back propagation process take care of computing the gradients. So let's uh, um, instantiate this for uh, the neural network that we had. But actually, I'm going to go back to this rotational convenience that we used before, and this kind of connects to the point about matrices and tensors. Uh, in practice, nodes represent not just single numbers, but actually uh, they can represent matrices, they can represent vectors or entire uh, or, or tensors. And if you want to think of these things as uh, in terms of programming abstractions, a vector is nothing but an array of numbers. Uh, a matrix is just a two-dimensional array of numbers. A tensor is a three, four, five, any n-dimensional array of numbers. So we would have something like this neural network. Rather than writing all these three pieces separately, you just have a single node called X that represents all three things. And that feeds into this node Z. Z, uh, and it, it, there are these parameters along the way. And uh, Z has, uh, re represents really the, uh, this entire vector. Z is a vector. And it represents the function sigmoid of W times X. And each element, this, this, this is shorthand for every element gets the sigmoid separately. And then we have another node Y, which is a, it turns out a single number, which is also uh, uh, represented, which corresponds to this function W, uh, uh, the vector W multiplied with Z. What I have not shown here, I've put them on the edges, but if you want to write this as a computation graph, you have W O here and W H here. And when I want to take partial derivative, this is at this point, it starts looking very much like that computation graph that I showed before. I want to take the der derivative of y, of y, maybe. We don't care about the derivative of y. We're going to actually connect this into a loss. If you want to take the derivative of the loss function with respect to w0, you go along this path here. With respect to w1, you go along this path here. And you keep doing this again and again. Um, of course, in the, every node has its own activation. Every node has a function that it calculates. OK. Let's abstract things out a little bit more. I'm going to talk about the chain rule for derivatives. You've seen this before. Uh, maybe not in these exact uh, in this notation, but you've probably encountered this and used this quite a bit before. Suppose you have a function y. Suppose y is a function of z and z is a function of x. That means y is also a function of x because when you change x, the value of y changes. So I can ask, what? Well, how do you find the gradient derivative of y with respect to x? And the answer is, even though y is not directly a function of x, it's a function of z, which is itself a function of x, of x. So I can multiply these partial derivatives, and I get the gradient of y with respect to x. Um, let's say now you have multiple ways of getting to y. So let's say y was actually a function of z1 and z2. And each z1 and each of these was actually a function of x. So how do you find the gradient of y with respect to x? This connects to the point where you have multiple paths to the same thing. Well, I first, I can take this path or this path. The, 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 if the one of those paths corresponds to the going along z1. So it is partial derivative of y with respect to z1 times the derivative of z1 with respect to x. The other path goes through z2 and performs a similar sort of thing. We can go, you know, we can, uh, what y is really a function of uh, the sum of these two things, so I'm adding the gradient. This is just saying the gradient of the sum, the gradient of a sum is simply the sum of the gradients. Just a rather tedious way of writing this. I could do this. It doesn't matter if it's two or if it's two hundred. I can just keep adding those things. If y is a sum of a bunch of functions of x, um, then y is a function of x as well. So I can ask what's the gradient of y with respect to x, it's simply the sum of all of these sorts of products. We have all the pieces we need to define back propagation. So I'm going to give you a cartoon illustration of back propagation, mostly for because uh, it's kind of easier to understand. And I, I want to kind of ground it in that 
strong network that we've been looking at. Um, so let's say we, we have this function. We have this neural network. Um, this is the network that took two inputs and produced an output Y, and then we were able to produce a loss. Uh, uh, for some reason, I've written the ground truth as Y star here, but nothing uh, should not be very uh, worrisome. So what we have is the loss. The loss is a function of all the parameters. And right, our goal is to compute the derivative of the loss with respect to every one of them. I'm going to show you how to do this without using any vector and matrix notation, just to kind of, um, at the risk of boring you a lot, uh, just to show you how this works without any magic. So importantly, uh, notice that L, the loss, is a differentiable function, or at least a, in this case, it's a differentiable function, but in general, a sub-differentiable function of all the weights. Oh, then and only then do we know how to apply back propagation. An interesting area of research is uh, what happens when that assumption is dropped. If we can talk about that offline if you're interested. So what we're going to do now is apply the chain rule. We're going to apply the chain rule again and again to compute all these partial derivatives, but we won't just apply the chain rule uh, blindly. We will do this in a certain order. And anytime we've computed a gradient, we're not going to just compute it and toss it away. We will remember it. By remembering all the partial computations that we've done, the next time we need that number, we don't need to recompute it. We can just read it. Together, by doing this, we get like a rather efficient uh, uh, algorithm for computing gradients. Let's uh, work through this one weight at a time. I promise I'm not going to do all the edges. I'm going to do maybe three. So first, let's compute the gradient of uh, the, the, the derivative of L with respect to uh, this weight here, W01. How did we compute? How, how, how is L connected to W001? Well, it's not directly a function of that, that parameter. It's a function of Y. Turns out Y is a function of that thing. So that means we can write the partial derivative of L with respect to that parameter is the derivative of L with respect to Y times uh, the partial derivative of y with respect to the, the weight that we care about. Each of these pieces is easy to compute. Why? Because we know this function here. So the gradient of the, de in fact, that's just a function of a single variable. So I can write dl by dy is simply 2y. No, 2y minus y star. Right? So that's easy. I can now, looking at this function, I can also ask what's the derivative of y with respect, you know, y with respect to w o zero one, that's simply one, because that's what it is, right? It's a linear function. So that means I have this, I have this. I can compute both. The, why do I have the first one? Because I'm assuming that we've finished the forward pass. Once we do the forward pass, we have the value of y. So. In any time you're doing back propagation, before you do back propagation, first you need to do the forward pass so that all the values of every node is known, including y and the loss and everything. And then, so essentially the way it works is first you do the forward pass, then you start computing the gradient from the top. So the first term here in this product is just y minus y star. The second term is just one. So we know how to calculate the partial derivative of L with respect to W001. We're done. Questions before we move on? Yes? Oh, it's written right up there. So, is that just the loss that we define? Yes, yes, it's the loss function that we have because our goal is to take the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameter. Remember, we are doing, we are situating this in the context of stochastic gradient descent. We have a loss for this particular um, example, and our goal is to take the gradient of that loss currently for this example and make an update. So, we assume that we have the 
uh, example, and we are computing the gradient of the loss. It's all it's all one loss. Yeah. The break in the, yeah. Into small, small pieces. Yes. It's, I guess I meant the loss is right. Like, yeah. So this is a very different way of thinking about it. If you've not seen it before, what I encourage you to do is to convince you that this is not completely off the charts by applying this exact idea for say logistic regression, maybe for your homework manually or for SVM. This should still work because there's nothing special about those things. And you should recover the same things that we had before. Okay, let's now do another weight, W011. That's this object here. Well, this thing, it turns out L is not directly a function of that either. L is a function of Y. And Y is a function of that weight. So again, I apply the chain rule. And now something curious happens. Um, the partial derivative of L with respect to Y is still Y minus Y star. I've already computed it for the previous thing. So I don't need to compute, I don't need to perform the subtraction again. You might say it's just a subtraction, but think of a 200 or 20,000 20, layer neural network, how much partial work do you uh, want to redo? So you can save that number and then reuse that value. And only compute this quantity here, which is simply uh, the partial derivative of y with respect to w o 1 1 which is just the value of v1 but because we've already done the forward pass we know the value of z1 we've already computed the value of z1 because that's how we got to the value of y which we used to calculate the value of l so we've done the forward pass and we've already finished we've already got all these intermediate uh, values so we we know the value of this because we just calculated that in the previous step we know the value of this because yeah, it's the from the forward pass Put them together and uh, by this caching of partial computation allows things to get faster this is the other big trick inside the in back propagation back propagation does not require i mean if well implemented will not require you to calculate the same thing twice because you can just remember it and now you see why as you have massive neural networks the size of the memory in a GPU is the thing that matters because all of this typically happens inside a GPU. So for the forward pass, you're remembering all these intermediate values. And for the backward pass, every time as you go down, you're remembering all these intermediate gradients. Let's do one more so that uh, we at least touch upon one thing that's a little bit like a little bit more tricky. So let's say we want to compute the great derivative of L with respect to this no is that the one yeah that weight there so it's the same story i would like to find the derivative of l with respect to that weight but l is not directly a function of that weight l is a function of y y is a function of z2 z2 is a function of the sigmoid the sigmoid is a function of the weight the value of the sigmoid depends on that weight so we have to go through four steps now so let's do this. Uh, I can ask what's the partial derivative of L with respect to W22. I'm just calling it W22. It's derivative of L with respect to Y times the derivative of Y with respect to W22. Well, now Y itself is this thing here. It's the derivative of this whole thing with respect to W22. Turns out W22 doesn't show up there at all. It's hidden inside the Z2 because that's how you get there. Um, these two terms, just because uh, I will lose my mind with the slide otherwise, don't, are not going to depend on W22, so I'm going to just toss them off. So then we just have, well, it, I can ask this, I can, the, the der derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. W01 doesn't depend on W22, so it just goes away. This is simply the constant here times the partial derivative of v1 with respect to w22 plus the constant w021 times this derivative this quantity becomes zero because v, uh, z1 doesn't depend on w22 at all this is the only thing that matters so let's clean it up and keep only that so that goes away and we are left with just this any questions so far by the way this is 
supremely boring. Uh, but that's the point. We are taking something that is, you know, complicated and, uh, you know, has all these interesting interpretations like gradients and converting it into something so tedious that a program could do it. That's the whole point here. Okay. Let's continue. Derivative of Z2. Well, what is Z2? Z2 is actually, remember, this was a sigmoid activation. Z2 is the sigmoid of this expression here. I'm going to break, um, I'm going to call that thing inside the sigmoid. I'll just, for the sake of uh, notation, I'll call it S so that I don't have to keep writing that. So Z2 is really sigmoid of S, and S is H plus. So I just introduced one more step in this process, just so that I can walk you through that thing. Well, Z2 is not directly a function of W22. Z2 is actually a function of S. And S is the function of W22. So again, I do the same thing. So I have the partial derivative of Z2 with respect to S times the partial derivative of S with respect to W22. This quantity, now at this point, I'm going to argue that we have everything we need. Why? Uh, this is from the previous slide. I just kind of wrote the last step here. Um, each of these partial derivatives is easy. The partial derivative of L with respect to Y, it's just Y minus Y star. With, of Z2 with respect to S is Z2 times 1 minus Z2. We already cal calculated the value of Z2. And why is that the case? Because Z2 is a sigmoid activation. We know how to calculate the gradient of sigmoid. This is something that we talked about when we did logistic regression. Um, the partial derivative of S with respect to W22 is just X2 here. And that means this quantity is just the product of this, 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 and this. But more importantly, along the way, we have probably already calculated many of these partial derivatives for previous weights. And we're not going to redo those calculations because, well, why do you want to waste time by doing the same thing twice? So we're proceeding backwards or in this picture from the top to the bottom. So we've already calculated some of these partial derivatives and we have cached them. We have memoized them. And so that saves us time. So let me now just summarize this because this is the, this was a tiny example. Uh, it took a bunch of a uh, bit of time, but it's still, you know, trust me, it's a tiny example. The same algorithm works for multiple layers for more complicated architectures. It's basically the same thing again and again. Uh, there's a question: Is backpropagation distributable to multiple machines, or is that more complicated? In theory, you can distribute it to multiple machines. You kind of partition the model across different pieces and you have multiple machines do the uh, different uh, parts of the back propagation. But in implementation, it tends to be a little bit more tedious because you need to store, you need to keep passing messages between those machines and that might end up becoming more complicated. But there are uh, certain software libraries that try to do that. So the the key point of back propagation is really it's a repeated application of the chain rule for partial derivatives. So first you perform the forward path so that every internal node in the neural network and the outside node and the value of loss and everything is gone. You compute the loss. Why do you compute the loss? So that you can log it and track the loss uh, for later. And then you proceed backwards uh, uh, from the neural network, uh, from, from, from the point of view of the graph that's the neural network. And you compute partial derivatives and apply the chain rule again and again. And every time you compute a partial derivative, you cache that value so that in case you need it again, you reuse it for the lower layer. It turns out the back propagation algorithm allows you to mechanize learning. It gives you the gradients for any neural network, for any computation graph, and the gradients give you what's needed to make the update inside gradient descent. Stochastic gradient descent is a generic learning algorithm because it's a generic optimization algorithm. Back propagation is a generic method for computing partial derivatives that can be plugged into stochastic gradient descent. So all we are left with is designing the architecture. 
So in some sense, a good part of machine learning, applied machine learning today involves not designing new learning algorithms, not designing new ways to compute gradients, but actually designing new architectures. Because then you can plug it into this uh, mechanical process and just chug away. That's what gives you things like, you know, some one person invents something, a neural network called the transformer architecture. This was in 2017 or 18. And then a whole bunch of people start applying the transformer model for a whole bunch of things, not worrying about, should I now worry about calculating the gradient for as I make the network bigger, because that propagation takes care of gradients. That propagation takes care of gradients, no matter whether the transformer was six layers, as it was done in the original paper, or 96 layers, or 9,000 layers. Doesn't really matter because it's the exact same procedure. Most modern neural network libraries, all modern neural network libraries, Implement, it, implement this automatic differentiation using back propagation. It allows us to uh, kind of innovate by exploring network architectures. And the reason we do that is because we don't want to keep deriving gradients by hand. So plugging this into stochastic gradient descent, basically the same process. You In each epoch, you shuffle the data, you pick a single example, you pretend that it's the entire data set, um, compute the loss, compute the gradient of the loss using back propagation, and then take a step in the opposite direction of the gradient. So everything that we did so far was inside this blue box. Questions? Questions about back propagation or any of these things? Yeah. It is a dynamic programming thing. Yeah. In fact, it's uh, there are some cool. Uh, Connections to other types of learning algorithms, other type, other named algorithms here. Yeah. Can you say that again, sorry? Yes, you're doing this for every single training example, for every single epoch, and uh, that's why it takes six months. Yeah. Is some information like preserved on the path between talks? Like, uh, is that not? That's a very good question. So the question is, is there any information that's preserved in the cache between epochs? Typically what happens, the, 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 the standard thing that uh, say, if you open up a PyTorch tutorial and start working with it, the first thing they say is inside each epoch, before you start computing the gradient, you first clear all the gradients so that the previous class is cleared because you're sitting on a new example. Um, every time you encounter a new example, you clear the gradient so that you can now rebuild the cache. Now, on the other hand, if you had some information about the gradients and partial derivatives from previous steps, maybe you can kind of do a little bit faster learning. And the trade-off there is, are you willing to give up that memory? Because all of this is kept in the RAM. And not just the, the CPU RAM, but the GPU RAM, which is typically much more uh, expensive. So there's a memory versus time trade-off, this time uh, favoring time, favoring uh, giving up memory. Yeah? So we can imagine things like time right? Yep. So those types of these ways of design you know, networks kind of offhand, but like, who wants to know more about that? Where would you there's a class called deep learning uh, that's offered next semester. In fact, there are possibly multiple classes with names like deep learning. Um, names like deep learning, that's what I have to say. Yeah, the thing is, it's important to kind of keep in mind that once you start talking about specific architectures, you have to ground it to specific types of problems. Convolutional neural networks are good for uh, image type problems. Models like transformers and recurrent neural networks are good for uh, sequences. Uh, graph neural networks are good when your inputs are graphs. And graph convolutional networks are also for graphs. So it depends on the problem and the problem comes from the application. So now we start talking about specific things. All right, we, yes. In this, 
Here. The black box is. Um, so the fact that a neural network is completely hiding all the intermediate computation, namely all these intermediate layers really don't have any external meaning. So for all, pra for all practical purposes, it's a black box because if you give me a, a 2000 layer neural network and you say it makes the right prediction for deciding, let's say whether uh, um, which street in America should get A for building a new, I don't know, street lights. That decision is if it's made by a neural network. I have no idea how it made that decision. All I know is it went through these 2000 layers in between it computed all these numbers, but those numbers have no meaning externally. That's why it's called a black box. It's a black box in the sense that it's not a black box because the numbers are hidden. You can always inspect them. It's a black box because they are uninterpreted. And that's why interpreting neural networks is a very important area of research. We have about nine minutes left. And I'm going to start something and hopefully finish it up at the end of uh, sometime in the beginning of the next lecture. And uh, the next lecture is going to be more of a, a big picture perspective on practical issues with machine learning, ethical concerns, and such things. But first, I'm going to talk about practical concerns with neural networks themselves. We've talked about what neural networks are. We've talked about training them. We've talked about uh, predicting with them. Let's talk about how to actually make use them. First of all, when we train neural networks with stochastic gradient descent, the loss functions that we build are no longer guaranteed to be convex. The reason they are not guaranteed to be convex is because the neural network itself is not convex. So even if your loss itself, the loss might be convex, but the neural network is not convex as a function of all the parameters. Sorry, the loss by as a function of just the label might be convex, but the loss is not convex in terms of all the parameters of the network. So there's no guarantee that uh, you will get to the local minimum. In practice, uh, uh, you know the, the neural networks that we see in real life are trained on massive amounts of data, and they themselves are massive. So you might have to use many, many thousands of epochs possibly for uh, them to train well. And this is why you need tons of CPU and more likely GPU time. And uh, there are also specialized hardware uh, that's designed for neural networks like Google's tensor processing unit, or uh, there's a machine called, there's a device called Cerebras. And you can also ask, what is the, how do you know how many epochs to run? Uh, there are multiple sort of, uh, ways to uh, decide how many epochs run. One is you just decide the number of epochs and say you're done. Uh, another thing you could do is threshold on the training error. If the training error goes below a certain threshold, then you stop training. Or you could uh, threshold on the loss. You, you know, if the change in the loss between epochs is less than some value, you decide that it converts and you stop. Or you have a validation set, like you're doing in your homework. There's a development set that you use to decide how many epochs to run. Um, all of these are usually done. This is uh, the, the, uh, the validation set is the one that's typically used to, uh, that's most commonly used, uh, at least in the recent literature. Now, you don't really have a way of avoiding local minima. We spoke about that briefly in the, uh, a little while back. You can try multiple initializations and pick the one that's the best, uh, or you can use voting. You have multiple different classifiers. You can build an ensemble of neural networks if you want. One thing that's uh, practically always done is something called the, the that uh, it's called uh, using mini batches, or these days it's just calling called using batches. So classic gradient descent says you pick one random example, pretend that it's the entire data set, and then you write down the loss function with that example, and you compute the gradient using that one example. Why do you need to pick only one example? Why not two? Why not 20? Why not a small number? Not the entire data set, but some small number so that you get a better estimate of the gradient. Because this is a, a estimate, you know, picking one example is treated as an estimate of the gradient. That idea is called a mini batch. The mini batch, or sometimes these days it's just called the batch, you collect a small number of examples instead of just one, 
and you present that that's the entire data set and you write down the loss for that and you compute the gradient how do you compute the gradient you start propagating same story nothing changes anywhere uh, except how many examples you pick to compute the gradient mini batches tend to be a little bit more robust than single uh, you know the mini batch of size one is what's written on top so mini batches with slightly larger sizes tends to be more robust but unfortunately that introduces a new hyperparameter what should be the size of the mini batch? Uh, it governs not, not necessarily the quality of the model, but how quickly the learning converges. And also how much memory you have, because now you need to store a whole bunch of, you know, not one example, but a bunch of examples and all their gradients in memory. So one heuristic that I've seen uh, kind of only half jokingly uh, uh, um, mentioned is the size of your mini batch depends on the size of your GPU. If you have a larger GPU, use a larger mini batch because you can afford to do it. There are many, many different tricks that are used with stochastic gradient descent. And this will be the last thing that I'll do for today. Simple gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent says we update the parameters using the gradient of an example. So we have the parameters, the new version of the parameters is old parameters minus some learning rate, times the gradient, GI. GI is the gradient for this particular mini batch. Now, unfortunately, this means that gradients can be can, can misbehave a bit. So imagine that this is the uh, loss surface that we are looking from the top, and our goal is to get to the bottom of this valley. Uh, yeah. And let's say we start here, and the gradient for this mini batch points us in like, a really awful direction. The next one kind of corrects a bit. The next one corrects a bit. and you can keep the, the gradients can keep changing on an average it might kind of take you there over many epochs or many updates but uh, when these gradients could change really really fast that means that learning every at any one step learning actually can make things worse than you are right now the update can make things worse so the quality of the model can change drastically just by the accident of you picking a bad mini batch right so to control for that, there's an idea called momentum. Momentum says, I'm not going to use just the current mini batch for making the updates. Instead, I'm going to keep a moving average of all the gradients that I have accumulated so far. So my current mini gradient is GI. And I have V, which is my moving average. I'm going to just accumulate my gradient into the uh, uh, this um, moving average. So Vt is simply the average of the previous average, Vt minus 1, and some step size, eta t, times the gradient. And the update to the parameters is done not with the gradient, but with this moving average of gradient. So you get a slightly smoother up, uh, gradient update. Questions about momentum? Yeah. How what? Oh, what momentum would do is so this particular gradient took you this way. This one, the next one might be the average of this and this. So it's really so the first gradient took you like this. The second one, if you had just used the gradient, it would be this way. This, but instead of updating with just the second red vector, you're taking the average of those two. So you'll actually get an update that looks something like this. So you are actually going this way here, and then you are slowly going to. It's going to be a much smoother. It's basically smoothing the these jagged edges. So we have a minute left. So I'm going to talk to you talk to you about um, one more trick. So the momentum is just the update is the average of the previous update and the gradient, and now we have a new hyperparameter. How should we mix these two things? We have the the hyperparameter of mu controls how much of the previous update should we remember? How fast should that moving average move? So we have a new hyperparameter. Uh, you don't really feel like doing hyperparameter search for momentum, just pick mu is 0.9. Why? Because it has worked in many data sets and it seems to work. <laughs> so 
that's one idea. And that's all we have the time for today. Uh, in the next lecture, I'm going to start with momentum and build up to something called Adam, which is like the standard thing that we use today and talk about a few more of these things, then continue with more practical concerns. All right, see you all on Tuesday. Don't forget your homework and all those things.